Thank you for joining me. My name is Tom Long. I'm with Daily FX, which is the research arm of FXCM. I work in the educational department. And I know I see a lot of familiar faces from the earlier talk, but so if you'll bear with me a minute, I'd like to introduce myself, tell a little bit about my background. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. I said it right that time for those of you who are, usually I say Chicago, see whose ears perk up. Uh, I'm from the south side. And like I had mentioned earlier, um, after I got out of the Army, it was time to find a job in Chicago. And most of the guys on the south side hop on the train. And downtown, the Rock Island train, which is the area I was, would take into the city, would drop you off at the options exchange, you know, right in where the Chicago Board of Trade, the options exchange, the stock exchange. And you know, it was in winter. And all my friends told me, well, just get a job right there at the exchanges because, you know, you know, when it's winter and it's cold out, if ever you walk down Cell Street in the winter when the wind's blowing about 40 miles an hour, it's kind of two steps up and one step back. It's, they don't call it the Windy City. Well, they do call it because of the politicians. But, you know, there's another reason they call it that because the wind does blow. You know, it creates like a canyon, like, you know, winds through there, and it hurts. There's actual pain involved in, in walking into the wind, you know, where the mustache would freeze when they get into the bank, and that wasn't a lot of fun. But so I got involved in the uh, financial markets at that time, ended up working at the Chicago Board of Trade for a while before I moved over to, actually it was Harris Bank, now known as Bank of uh, Montreal, or Harris Nesbitt, and became a bond trader. And it was really there is when I really started to learn about trading. I mean, I mean, I, I, everybody starts the same way, you know, you, you think, what is this? What is this all about? This looks fun. And you read about all these people who are doing well, and you say, well, you know, I've got to find out what's going on here. You know, when you get in there and you, and you start to learn, you work your way up, you know, and, and you risk some money and you lose it, and you go, you know, there's, I know there's something here, but I don't know what it is. You know, when I was lucky enough um, at the bank where I learned um, trading from traders who had been in the business for 30 or 40 years, and, and, and trust me, that is the best place to learn about trading. Because, I, I, like I was telling earlier, I used to say something, and, and they would just like give me a look like, you know, where did you read that? And I said, well, you know, it, it's in a famous book. You know, and they would laugh. <laughs> famous book. Yeah. Was the, guy, was the guy a trader? I don't know. So, obviously, you'd listen to guys who had been in the business for, for decades who knew what they were doing. And, you know, you start picking up things that are a little bit different, you know, from what you read in, the, um, in a lot of the books today. And... So we're going to talk about some, some, technical, some indicators today, excuse me. <coughs> but it's really important to understand that these are tools, okay? These are tools in our trading. And, and even a basic hammer is, is much more valuable in the hands of a craftsman than it would be in the hands of an apprentice, okay? So when we use technical indicators, what I like to stress upon people is that is really the last thing we want to do in our trading approach is a refer to the indicator, okay? Too many people will look at the indicator first and look for trading opportunities when in fact that should be about the last step we take, okay? And we covered that a little bit before for those of you who are sitting in on the chart reading. And I'm going to kind of go through the same process to bring other people aboard. And, and I always like to point out speculative trading, okay, should be risk capital only. Okay? If it's money that you can't afford to lose, guess what's going to happen? The market's going to know that and it's going to take it from you. Okay? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you're like, well, I have to make this money this month, you know, what happens is you, know, you don't and then you push yourself to try to make it you know, and then you risk a little bit too much and that's when you start getting in trouble. Okay? So make sure it's money that you don't care. I don't want to say don't care because I don't think anybody... Well, if you don't care about your money, you can just pass it on up to the front. I'm sure there are many people here that would like it. You know, but the fact is that to be a successful trader, you have to be okay with losing. You don't have to like it, but you have to be detached of the outcome of any individual trade. Okay? Because as soon as you have some emotional attachment to that trade, you know, you're going to let your emotions take over your decision-making process. That usually means fear and greed, and bad things happen when you do that. Okay? We want to identify a trade before we go to the indicator, okay? And a lot of people really don't understand just what a, what a trading opportunity is, what a trade looks like on a chart. So I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the market environment where we want to look for a trade, and then we want to apply the tool, the technical indicator, which are only designed to help you time your entry, okay? Indicators only tell you when to get into the trade. You first have to be able to identify what a trading opportunity looks like on a chart before you can use that tool, right? 
I mean, you need nails to use a hammer, okay? We need a trade setup in order to use the indicator to help us get into the trade. What I look for is when the market is in a strong uptrend, I look for a pullback off the high, okay? That's where a lot of people get into trouble because they start saying, well, it's changing, so I'm going to start selling it here. And what happens? They sell just as the market moves down to support. The buyers come back in because they love buying things on sale too, okay? The reason the market's in an uptrend is because the fundamentals are pushing it up, which also brings me to the point I hear a lot of people talking about, I really don't understand the fundamentals of the market. You know, nobody does. Okay? Nobody can possibly take all that information and anticipate how traders are going to react. Okay? A lot of people like to trade news re releases. Okay? It's, the mo it's the worst thing to try to do when you're trading. Okay? Predicting what the uh, news is going to be is one thing. Predicting how the traders are going to react is actually sometimes quite opposite okay? because of expectations. So we want to identify the strong trend in a market because a trend, the direction of the trend, is how you incorporate, or how I feel you incorporate fundamentals into your trading. Okay? The reason markets are in strong uptrends is because the fundamentals support the market moving up. The reason that market is in a strong downtrend is because the market fundamentals are supporting a strong move down. So instead of trying to figure out non-farm payrolls or PPI or CPI or some of the numbers coming out of Japan, you know, the 7-Eleven Slurpee count, you know, I mean, they actually follow, you know, the convenience store count, you know, and I'm not sure how to identify trade like that. Maybe I'm just not that smart, but I'm okay with not being that smart, okay? Because I know that if the market's in a strong uptrend, then the fundamentals say that the market should be in a strong uptrend. So that's how I incorporate fundamentals. Just keep it, keep it as simple as possible. Okay, for those of you who heard before, this is obviously my favorite uptrend right now. This is the Aussie Swiss daily chart, okay? I've got about one year of trading on this. And basically what I'm looking for is every time the market moves down to a support level, that is when I'm looking to get in on the buy side, okay? Instead of looking into sell, if you find that yourself that you're looking to sell because you think the market's going to continue moving down, you are probably on the other side of my trade. I'd like to take this moment to thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. But thank you anyway. Now, a selling opportunity is opposite, obviously. We want the market to be in a strong downtrend, and we're looking for a rally up to resistance. Okay? And then when we use the, indi the indicator and we see that momentum is changing, that usually means that there's a pretty good chance of a reversal and a move back down because the fundamentals support the market moving down. And this is my favorite downtrending market right now. This is my favorite market. I'm thinking of moving to Australia because I love the Australian dollar so much that I'm looking for resistance points because I'm looking for a reversal back down to the downside. And I know he had somebody asked before, well, how do I identify that support and resistance? Because it's very difficult to do that. It's very easy for me to put a chart up here and, and draw lines there and put that. I understand that, okay? But that's where the technical indicators come in. When we see this market in a strong downtrend and it starts to move up, that's where the indicators come into play. That's what can tell us what is actually the resistance point and the potential reversal back to the downside. It's only at that point that we should be referring to indicators in our trade. Because the indicators are not going to tell us this is in a strong downtrend. You can do that yourself. Now, having said that, I'm always, I already know I'm going to backtrack because I think I remember what the next slide was. The first basic indicator that I use is the simple moving average. It is extremely valuable, and it is, as I'd mentioned earlier in, in one of my workshops, it is the most popular indicator used by professional traders. Just about all of them will have a 200-day simple moving average on their chart, okay? Because most of your successful traders trade in the direction of the trends. They're trend traders. They're breakout traders, they're trend traders, they're momentum traders, whatever you want to call them, they're all the same thing. They're looking for big moves in the direction of a, of a predetermined trend because that's where you find the big moves, okay? It's not unusual to see guys, to see traders, I shouldn't say guys, you know, but to see traders be in markets for, for weeks or months on end because they found a strong trending move and they're just going to milk it for as much as they can get out of it, okay? That's trading. So 
If we have a 10-day simple moving average, basically what we're doing is we're taking the closing prices from the previous 10 days, adding them together, together, excuse me, dividing by 10, and then we'll plot that on our chart. And as we do that every, every day at the close, obviously that number will change, and we just connect those dots. And it kind of gives us a flow of what the market is doing, a quick idea. I used to call it a reference point. I mean, I can call up the chart with a 200-day simple moving average on there and really have to not do much analysis about the trend itself because it just kind of shows me what it's doing. We can see on the Aussie Swiss, this is the 200-day simple moving average. It's moving up. I mean, it is really just kind of moving straight up. And we can see the market. There's a nice separation between the two. And it, the market's moving up. It's above the 200-day simple moving average. The moving average is moving up. It doesn't get much better than that you know, for an uptrend. Okay? This, is, this is the pair that we want to look for for buying opportunities. Because we can see that every time it moves down, it moves up to new highs. We're looking for that stair step formation. Okay? Um, whether you do this on a daily chart, I've had a lot of people ask, you can also do it on a four hour chart. If I'm looking for this on a four hour chart, I, always, I do want to make sure that the daily chart is showing an uptrend. It doesn't have to be the strongest, but certainly I want it to be in an uptrend. Because I don't want to get in just as a, you know, trading against the trend on the daily chart because I'll, I know I'll get burned that way. Okay, but if, if I like this, I could go down to the four hour chart and look for buying opportunities because the daily trend is, is strong to the upside. Okay? And on the Euro Aussie, we can see the 200 day simple moving average once again. I mean, it's been below it for at least a year. And we can see they're both moving down. I mean, it's just, it's just you know, almost parallel to each other. Okay, it really doesn't get much better than this for a downtrending market. Okay, N not necessarily that we need the technical indicator on there to help it, you know, but you can see where it almost gives you instant confirmation. It's just, it's just a reference point. Because you have to understand that, you know, we're only going through, I'm following about um, 20 currency pairs. I typically follow the currency pairs that have the lowest spread. Hey, you know, any edge. Trading is all about identifying edge and exploiting them until they're not there anymore, you know. And, um, but you have to realize that a lot of professional, particularly mutual fund, you know, guys who are running mutual funds are looking at hundreds and hundreds of stocks. So they don't have time to do all that analytical work, which is why they're doing the simple 200 day moving average. And you can actually code that, you know, to see the kind of separation so they can have a computer do it for them. You know, but it's really the same thing. It's just a reference point. It filters out the noise and it gives you an idea of the general trend of the market. Now, one of the questions I haven't gotten today, by the way, I like, I'd mentioned it late, but I, I like to do very casual workshops. So if anybody has any questions, you can just raise your hand at the time, because um, obviously the, maybe it's something that I missed or, or didn't clarify enough. And, and I know that if somebody has a question, there's probably about 15 to 20 people thinking the same thing. So we, it's always good to bring it out in the open. But the question I get is Tom, which is good. That's my name. So they got that right. But they say, what about the exponential moving average? You get the question, which one is better? Okay? And I don't know. You know, they really both do the same thing. Okay, we understand that an exponential moving average kind of spends a little bit more emphasis on the most recent data. Okay? So it kind of explains it here that the most recent price has an 18.18 or 18% on um, the most recent close, okay? And if it's a 10-day simple moving average, that number is 10%, okay? It has 10% weight, remember? 10 days equally, add them up, divide by 10. And exponential moving averages just puts a little bit more weight on the most recent activity. So moving averages are really one of the first indicators that started in the markets, you know? I mean, this goes way back, way back uh, to 100 years ago when they were doing it by hand. It was very easy. You know, if you wanted a 10-day moving average, you can do it by hand. It wasn't that difficult, okay? The exponential moving average became a little bit more because, you know, there's a little bit more, more math involved. But this actually started um, after World War II because the, the math used in developing the radars, which was the newest technology in World War II, um, was similar to the math that they used for the exponential moving average. So after World War II, you had all of these, you know, radar people you know, come into the financial markets after the war ended and start applying what they had learned in the military into the markets. So, hence it was born, the exponential moving average was born just for that. 
And basically the big complaint about the simple moving average is that it reacts slowly to the market. So what they did was just use that, that math that they learned in, in radar and applied it to the markets so they have a faster reacting moving average. You know, but I'm not really looking for a fast reacting moving average in my trading. I'm just looking for a little bit of help in identifying the trend. Okay. Um, the 200-day simple moving average is, is really very, very popular, and you can see how the market will react to it. The exponential moving average, probably the 10-day exponential moving average, is, it may be the second most popular, particularly for short-term traders. Because of a book by Marty Schwartz, famous trader. Eh, he's from New York, but I'll talk about him anyway. The um, pit bull. He talked about the 10-day exponential moving average being his favorite indicator for short-term trading. So, you know, he was one of, the, one of the great traders, you know, still is. So, of course, everybody wants to do the 10-day exponential moving average, you know. But it's become very popular, so the market will react to that one still, because you can still buy copies of Pitbull on Amazon. But the, whether it's one's better than the other, I mean, that, that, that's just not a question that can be answered, okay? One's not better than the other. It's just different, you know. It looks nicer though than the simple moving average, but it really is telling me the same thing that you know the trend is up. And on the Euro Aussie, the 200 day exponential moving average, the trend is obviously down on this. We talked about a little bit about stochastics in one of my previous workshops. And a lot of people ask me, and this is you know, one of my favorite indicators, not that I use it all my time in the trading, but it you know, just really talks to me. You know, but that doesn't mean that because I'm, you know, I just want to clarify, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, just because it, it talks to me and, I, and it's easy for me to read, doesn't mean that it's easy for each of you. Okay? I, mean, this, I am not sitting up here saying that this is the best indicator you can use. Um, all I'm saying is, you know, I like it. That's all. But uh, it was developed by George C. Lane from Watsika, Illinois. This, it's actually about central Illinois, it's a farming community. And that tells you what? The guy was a big time grain trader in Chicago. Okay? And he developed quite a few indicators, this one being the stochastic oscillator, otherwise known as stochastics. And really, what it looks for is the thought process was that when the market's in a strong uptrend, the closing price is going to be near the high of the day, more often than not. Okay, I mean, it makes sense. If the market continues to move up, there's more buying pressure than selling pressure. And in a downtrend, the market is going to close closer to the low of the day more often than not. And that's basically what he's measuring. Okay? But just to make sure that he, he uses other indicators, you've got the, the fast stochastic, you've got the raw stochastics, and the percent D, which is a moving average of percent K. Okay? Slow stochastics, we're just going to add another moving average on there. So we've got the raw stochastics, we have the percent D, which is a, a moving average of the uh, stochastics, and then you have another, you have a slow D, which is a moving average of the moving average of the stochastics. Okay? I mean, we can go on and on and on and on, and it really comes down to a lot of these indicators are basically moving averages just looked at in a different way. They're fancy moving averages, what I like to call them. You know, but it's a different way to look at the market. There's, there's a, a million different windows to look in the market to find, to find solid trading opportunities. Okay, uh, maybe the bad thing is that the four or five that work for me may not may not be the ones that work for you. Okay, you know, but there are some things that all the successful traders have in common. I shouldn't say all, because as soon as I say all, I told some gentlemen, I hate saying never. Well, all is the same thing. Most of the successful traders are very adamant about trading with the trend. Okay, and they're very very good at money management. Everything else you do really can be as unique as, you know, is your interest in music, you know, because I like one kind of music or one kind of food and, and you like something different, doesn't mean that my tastes are better. I mean, they're just different, okay? It's just, it's, just, it's just different interests, okay? But the two things that most successful traders have in common is that they're trend traders and they're very, very good about money management. The tools they use to identify their entry and exit is as unique as each individual trader, okay? That's the good news, though. Now this is the fast stochastics, and I think I have a setting of five and five, which you will find on the, um, the default settings for most of the uh, FX charting packages. 
five and five or five and three. You know, it's kind of crazy. I look at this and I, you know, this doesn't clarify anything. I'd rather look up here. This looks like much neater and much cleaner. And I can tell, I can't tell anything here. So what I like to do, my preference is using slow stochastics and I like to slow it down even further. We had talked about before, we use IntelliCharts, I use IntelliCharts and the default setting for slow stochastics is five, five and five. And, and I, like I said, I come from a futures background being from Chicago and most of the default settings on futures or stock charting packages are 14, three and three. You know? And I, I like that, I like slowing it down because I wanted less signals and the trade-off is that they're more reliable. And that seemed like a good trade, you know? You know, so I do that. And when it was five, five, and five, instead of changing it to 14, three, and three, and I started telling people this, and they just looked at me like, you're kidding me, and that's why you're telling me? I just put a one in front of the first five and made it 15, five, and five. 14, three, and three, it took too much time for me to do it. And at, you know, obviously I looked and see if there was a difference. There isn't that much of a difference, you know, so, so it was the same thing. Um, but on the market scope charting packages, I think the default is, is, is five, three, and three. Um, no, I don't know what it is, but anyway, I just made that 14, three, and three, okay? But on this one, it's five and five, and you can see that typically, that it, it, that doesn't, it doesn't tell me a lot, you know? And on the downside, we've got the same thing. The idea is to look for the market, you know, to move up here, because that, then it reaches extreme, you know, but it's very difficult on a default setting to really get a signal to enter into the trade. Yes, sir? You better believe it. I'm going to get into that in a second. I'm setting you up. <laughs> no. No, if I go, if I'm on 15, 5, and 5, and I'm going from the daily to the 4-hour, even on the hourly, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at 15, 5, and 5. Okay. It, the charting package will automatically adjust. All right. Now, this is what I would prefer to see. This is slow stochastics, and you can see I've got a 14, 3, and 3 here. We've got a market that shows a strong uptrend. It's above the 200-day simple moving average. They're both moving up. And you can see the buy is when it moves below 20 and then crosses over. Okay? To me, this is much clearer, and it's much easier to identify solid trading opportunities. Okay? But as you can see, these match with you know, the markets as they pull back, but they really identify the resistance and the potential reversal for us. So in that way, using technical indicators become a very, very valuable tool to help us identify our entries. You know, but remember, the first step is to first identify that strong trending market. Yes, sir? Oh, my goodness. Did I forget to tell you? The question is, what time frame chart? This is a daily chart. Technical analysis works best on the daily chart. As the time frame shortens, all of the signals become less reliable. The reason is simply sampling. There are just more trades in one candle on the daily chart that represents the opinions of traders from all over the world trading in a 24-hour period. That's pretty good yardstick to use for judging the mood of the market. On the other extreme, the one-minute chart could be two guys named Bob duking it out, just getting out of trades and not even getting into trades. It's got nothing to do with the trend. It has really nothing to do with the mood or the, the momentum of the market. It's just two guys trading when nobody else is trading. You're, you're giving a one-minute candle in the, in the middle, of, at the end of the Asian session when nobody's really trading the same weight as one, you know, say maybe at 8 a.m. Eastern in the morning when London and New York are both trading. You just can't do that. Okay? So technical analysis is best on the daily chart and it loses reliability as the time frame shortens. I'd mentioned earlier that I think that once you get below the hourly chart, successful traders rely more on instinct and gut feel than they do on pure math, which is just using indicators to get in and out, okay? And it's very difficult for new traders to depend on something they just don't have yet, you know? But unfortunately, most new traders will start in a five minute chart, you know, and then, you know, have issues about trading because, well, maybe they're in it for the excitement. I hear a lot of people say that. I'm in it because it's very exciting. And, you know, <laughs> our brain hears what we're saying, and it creates it as the truth. You know, so if you're in it for the excitement, that's fine. Um, I'm in it for the profits. Yes, sir? Yeah? Well, you can be a short-term trader. <laughs> I just don't know if you can be a short-term profitable trader. It's very difficult. I think 
Of course it's done. There are a lot of traders that do that. But I do think that they earn the right to be short-term traders. I do think that you can do it, but it's more of, I've seen this before, this is what I'm expecting. There's more instinct and gut feel in it, rather than just a crossover on stochastics. Because in a one minute chart, trends last, what? Maybe 12 to 15 minutes. You know, by the time that indicator rolls over, the trend's half over, and it's very difficult to find a profitable trade. You know? But yeah, I would, you know, I would pretty much do the same thing. I would still look for strong trending markets. If I, was, if I wanted to trade on a one minute chart, I'd call up a five minute chart and look for the strong trends and go on a one minute chart and trade in the same direction of the trend. Anything to get the momentum of the market on my side. So he's using a long, a chart. Yeah. 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 Well, they're not always in sync, but I like using a combination. Sure. Yeah, I like using a four to six to one ratio between my time frames because I want some continuity. Okay. To me, it doesn't make much sense to identify a strong trend in the daily chart and go down to the one minute chart and trade. Okay. There's no continuity between the one minute and the daily chart. But it, plays into that. it does, but it, it plays into the trend on the five minute chart more accurately. So and I no, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying I agree. If I'm trading on a five minute chart, you know, I may use a 30 minute chart to identify the trend. If I'm on an hourly chart, I'll use a four hour chart. And if I want to trade, you know, like on a one minute chart, I'll use the five minute chart to identify the trend. Anything to make sure I'm trading with the momentum of the flow of the mark of the, of the trades. Okay. Yes, sir. I'll get you in a second. How do you get the indicators on the charts like that? Is there some kind of... There's this button right here on the market scope. If I click on that, it pulls a menu down. You can add indicator you want. Yeah. That one is add indicator. Okay. If it's not there, pull this one down and you'll see it there. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. The question is the circles I have at the bottom. What I'm looking for is the crossover. It's moved down below 20 and I'm looking for the crossover of the lines and then I'm entering at the open of the next candle. Yes, those are entries. Never. Hopefully I'm in it and hanging on. Yeah. Um, that it, working the trade is one way to do that, yes. And that's typically what I do. Um, it's a very difficult thing to teach, you know, and our main responsibility is teaching rather than, you know. And so I typically teach new traders to use a one to two risk reward ratio. Okay. When, when we're entering here after the crossover, and let's say we enter on this candle here, I'm putting my stop below the, the low candle there. So I know my risk before I get into the trade. I just look for, for twice that and put in a limit order to get out with the, um, okay. As I'd mentioned earlier, you can pick the strongest trends. Everything can be perfect. Everything is good, but you still have to expect to lose half your trades. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I look at, the, I, I see that all the time on divergence. Um, obviously I'm only looking for divergence in the direction of the trend. You know, because there is just no way that I would use indicators or anything other than just pure mathematics or the stair step formation to get out of a trade. Okay. If I see divergence and people are selling, but it's still an uptrend, you know, I'm, I don't care. You know, I'll just stay in the trade. Basically, I let, I let this part tell me when to get out and just ignore all that. Okay. Because I have to remember that I'm, what I'm trading is based on the price of the market. You know, not where an indicator is. You know, so I really don't use indicator to, to tell me when to get out of, out of a trade. Once I get in, it's done what it's supposed to do. It helped me time my entry, and that's all I need it for. I can just take it off the chart. I, I really don't need it after that. Okay, I missed one. Yes, sir. Well, the question is, you know, where do I place my stops? As soon as, as, soon as I see this and I get in on the trade, if the market moves down to a new low here, otherwise this is going to represent the lows of, of the moves down. Okay, this is easier to see. Okay, this is lined up pretty much with that one. If I'm getting in on the candle, the second one after my stop goes below the low, because if the market moves back down to make a new recent low, then something's changed, and it's usually a news event that'll do it to me, and it will. It'll happen. Well, not all the time, but maybe 50% of the time. Get back into that 50% number. I think of trading as a coin toss. I will get to you. Right? <laughs> I think of trading as a coin toss. Okay, got a 50-50 chance of being right. Okay, so if I bet a dollar and I win on heads, and if I bet a dollar but I lose on tails, after about 100 tosses, I'm really just a break-even trader, right? Because the coin toss is a 50-50 chance. 
There's going to be little runs there where you're going to get three and five in a row. But that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the approach or anything wrong with the coin. It's just a numbers game. Okay? So I either have to be profitable, get, get it the coin to come down on heads more than tails, which is almost impossible, and most traders think the same thing about their trading results, or I need to make more money when I'm right than I lose when I'm wrong. So now if it comes up heads, I win $2, and if it comes up tails, I lose $1. I want to flip the coin 24 hours a day, seven days a week, taking time off for meals, of course, because I've got the numbers on my side, and I just want to continue to hammer it, because I found an edge, and I'm just going to exploit it until it disappears. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, the re oscillator means that it just shows you an extreme between zero and 100. It's just a way to, to reference the momentum from one side to the other. Instead of a raw number, it's relative to where it's been. So it can never go over 100, and it can never go under zero. Basically, it's a way just to simplify how to use the tool. So an extreme, meaning when the market is overbought, is when it moves above 80. That's considered overbought using an oscillator, in this case, stochastics. If it goes under 20, it means it's oversold. OK? No, not to me. No, not to me. The, um, but we identify an uptrend by a market that moves overbought and stays there for a long time. OK? Downtrends, markets will move to oversold and stay there. That's what makes them a trend. So what I'm looking for is an oversold situation and uptrend. Okay, because to me that's going to be more temporary in nature. And in fact, this kind of shows that it is. So we first identify a strong trending market. I'm only looking for buying opportunities. I don't care how many signals it shows me to sell this. I'm not going to sell it because the trend is up, and that's more important than any technical indicator, the direction of the trend. Okay, so I'm only looking for buys. So I'm only looking for buy signals using the, the uh, stochastics oscillator. Did that answer your question? Good. Yes, sir. Oh, well, thank you. I'm making most of it up as I go, though, so I don't. What I wanted to say is, I got lost in the. When you were getting back to that two to one, I took over that again. My risk reward ratio? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing I determine when I get in, the idea is how do you determine the one to two risk reward ratio? Before I get into the trade, I determine my risk on the trade, okay? Otherwise, it's unlimited risk. Well, except for the margin watcher feature, you know. And so I know how much I'm risking on the trade before I ever click buy or sell, okay? I mean, you can't have a strong money management approach if you're going to wait and see what the market does after you get in and then decide to get out. No, no. It's got everything to do with the bottom of this move down to resistance. Or excuse me, support. <laughs> I did say that. The, uh, the pullback down to support. This will tell me when it's reversing back to the upside. And this entry will be about two or three candles probably after that low. So my stop goes below that low. Is that, is that a swing trade? Yeah. Yeah. For those who don't, swing trading is basically finding a strong trending move and perhaps moving down to the next lower time frame and p trying to play the swings within that trending move. Okay, but again, you have to identify a trend before you do that, right? Because otherwise, you know, it's really not swing trading. No, I, boy, I'd love to think I could do that, but you know, I just, <laughs> you know, it. I was I was just in a trade recently that lasted about six weeks. And um, because the, the market just continued to move in my direction. Um, I typically will use, and it's in the advanced indicators and also my breakout trading workshops tomorrow, um, price channels. Otherwise, I'm using 20-day high, 20-day lows. And so I will enter on a 20-day low and just ride it until it bounces up to a 20-day high. If anybody, we were talking before about the turtle traders in Chicago, and that's all they were doing. And I'm, I was influenced by anybody in Chicago who was success, trading successfully. Um, so basically, I, I, just, I just continue to trail my stop down and challenge the market to reverse and stop me out. And hopefully it doesn't do that. If, if, I'm, in a, if I'm a day trader, that means I got stopped out the day I got, stopped, I got into the trade. You know? And that's not my goal. My goal is to, 
I'd love to put one trade on just staying up for the whole year because then it's continue to move in my direction. But that doesn't usually happen. One pip. Yeah. To me, a breakout's a breakout. Is it any more of a breakout if it goes 10 pips, or did I just give away nine pips that wasn't necessary? The reason that becomes support and resistance is because there are a number of orders sitting right there. If it goes one pip through the previous low, it's cleaned out all those orders and there's no more support left. Okay? And it may bounce back up, but it'll come back down because traders say there's nobody left. You know, the, the path of less resistance is at a downside. Let's hammer them. And so one pip is a breakout to me. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do the trailing stop, but it's difficult to teach people how to do that. So we recommend a one to two risk reward ratio and try to, and if you continue to identify solid trading opportunities, you should be able to win half of your trades. Okay, we just try to teach people how to make more when they're right than they lose when they're wrong. Uh, tomorrow in the more advanced workshops, yeah. Yes, sir, in the back. Two whole days. Usually I'm in the big room in the middle between talks. Okay. He's hijacking the workshop. <laughs> Thanks. RSI, Relative Strength Index. It's another oscillator. Okay. It really tells you something very similar as stochastics does. The difference was, well, there really isn't that much of a difference between the two. It's basically where the market closes, you know, in reference to where the market closed the previous day. So it's kind of looking at the same thing in a different way, okay? But again, it's an oscillator. It's between zero and 100. The main difference is overbought is considered at the 70 level and oversold is at the 30 level. Now, I always had, I explained in the other one, I've had an issue with RSI since I started using it to where if you look here, it, it, it doesn't show any opportunities to get into the trade in the direction of the uptrend, okay? Where we looked at the uh, stochastics oscillator and we slowed it down even and used a slow one and we had six entries. And in this one we had none. So I really have an issue with this. And for those of you who are gonna hang around tomorrow for the advanced class, I will introduce you to a couple of traders Chicago who saw the same thing and introduced a new indicator called stochastics RSI, okay? But on the downside, it was the same thing with the Euro Aussie. You know, nothing, nothing above 70. But I did find one just to show that it does exist. And there was one on the Aussie dollar as it found support at the 200-day moving average. Uh, but for me personally, because the market moved down to this low, I'm probably moved on to another currency pair and not traded this one. So I don't use RSI. I promised I would get, okay, who, who was raising their hand? I, no, there you are. Thank you. Yeah, I know I hear that a lot. And I also hear markets are range bound 80% of the time, and I don't buy any of it. I don't buy any of it. I, yeah, it is. You know, when, yeah, I mean, these experienced traders told me, you know, I want to look for a buy. And they go, why are you trading, you know, that market? Well, you know, support resistance. And they go, why don't, if you're going to buy, why don't you find a market that's moving up? You know, so I, well, yeah, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> yeah, I just don't buy that range bound stuff. But I, I'd mentioned before, by the time I can identify a range and look to trade it, it's ready to break out, you know. Or else I see that non-farm payrolls are coming up in about 12 hours, and that's why it's been in a range, because nobody wants to be the guy to push it out or up above, okay? We had one a question back here. Yes, sir. Yeah, you sure can. You can move this down, and in some charting package, you'll see 7 or 11. But I just had an issue about speeding up an indicator because I think it gives me a lot of losing signals. I prefer to slow them down, so it was just kind of going against what I believed, and that's just my own personal preference. Yeah. 
Well, well, that's what you have to do, you know, but if it just doesn't work for you, I think there comes a point in time where it's time to move on. Unless my goal is to be a success, successful RSI trader, which it wasn't, it was just time to move on. And that's what I did. But that, you know, that, that's just my personal preference. Okay? Yes, sir. That's a strong trending market. Uh, hopefully, I'm in the trade and riding along with it. Well, I look for when it, when, when it moves against the trend. Okay? To me, that's when I start looking to get in the direction of the trend. It's like buying something on sale. You know? And as long as I believe that that trend is still intact, you know, if the market's giving me a cheaper price, I'm going to take it. You know? I'm just not, you know, I just can't stop myself. <laughs> and hopefully, when it moves up and it stays overbought in an uptrend, I'm there right along with it, trailing my stop and taking advantage of that strong, strong trending move. MACD, Gerald Appel, just in case you were wondering. Not Apple. MACD, the ultimate in a moving average indicator. The default setting of 12, 26, and 9 is a, the difference between a 12-period moving average and a 26-period moving average. And j just for the heck of it, we'll throw a 9-period moving average on the difference. Okay, but it's actually not a bad indicator. Typically, because there are, there's another level of moving averages on this one, the signal generated by MACD will be later than slow stochastics or if an RSI click a signal, okay? But being later is not always a bad thing. What they say about the, you can tell the pioneers they were the ones with the arrows in their chest, you know? <laughs> being early or being late is really not the key. Being profitable is the key. Okay, so being late is not always a bad thing. You know, I know you're sitting there waiting for the crossover and you're ready to go, you're ready to click buy, and the candle closes and guess what? It didn't cross over yet. You go, man, another four hours or another day? I'm just going to get in now because I know it wants to cross over. Okay, you just broke one of your rules to trading. And the market knows when you do that and loves to punish you. Uh, but the MACD, um, I prefer when the crossover, when I'm looking for buy, crossovers happen low because that's usually when the market's pulled back a little bit. And that's what I'm looking for, right? Uptrending market, a pullback down to a support level, and then they get in again with the direction of the trend. And uh, the MACD um, divergence is, is a very strong signal. But again, you know, we can see one right here, you know, up higher high. And it came back a little bit, but, you know, and they're coming back to where Tom is waiting to get in again with the direction of the trend, okay? So it really doesn't mean a trend change. So you have to be careful about taking any signal against the trend. Yes, sir. Yeah, it does. I mean, the question is, you know, these indicators, which are just levels and levels of, of moving averages, you know, they just slow them down to the, almost to the point where, you know, they should, should be flatlining, you know. Uh, but that's what indicators are, you know. That's why you can't put too much emphasis on what an indicator is telling you. You know, you say, well, the, you know, it looks like the market is moving up, but I notice that RSI is moving down, so I'm going to sell. You know, no. You've got to go it the other way around, you know. The market is moving up, but the RSI is moving down. Get rid of RSI if you want and move, put something else on there. Or you know, start looking for the buying opportunity. And the same thing on our Euro Aussie. We can see a couple of crossovers here. And um, it turned into some nice, uh, so potentially, I should say potentially, some nice selling opportunities. Okay. Bollinger Bands. You know, there is a guy named Bollinger. A money manager and an author which is why he developed Bollinger Bands. What better way to market yourself than to name an indicator after yourself and have it on every charting package in, the, you know, in the, all financial markets? We're talking about them, so it worked. But actually, his indicator, it, it's basically a 20-period moving average, but he's going to throw an additional filter on there, and that filter is a volatility filter. So when the market starts really jumping around, the two bands will start to widen. Okay. When there's a very little volatility, the bands will start to narrow. And when the bands get real narrow, that's when you start looking for breakouts in the direction of the trend. Okay, let's look at some, some, some examples. We've got an uptrend, and every time it tests the lower bands, that is a potential buying opportunity. 
But what's important to note, and even John mentions it, that it, it does not give you an actual signal to buy. A lot of people have created some, but what I would like to do is when I see this on a daily chart, I will move down to the four hour chart to look to time my entry in the direction of the trend, okay? But you can see that every time it's pulled back and touched the lower bands, it hasn't been there a whole long time before it reverses and moves back in the direction of the trend, okay? But I think really what's value about this is, is see how the bands are getting tight here together compared to this? Where you see you had the volatility and the bands widen and here they get tight. Usually, you, you, that usually precedes a breakout, okay? I think volatility is more cyclical than prices. Otherwise, it inhales and exhales on almost a regular basis. Uh, and tomorrow in the advanced indicator class, there's an indicator actually called Bollinger Band Width that is available on MarketScope, and we're going to talk about that one tomorrow. Did you get it? And on the downside, we have the same thing, that every time the market touches the upper band, um, that's a potential uh, it's a sell setup. I would not call it so much a selling opportunity, but I like to move down to a four-hour chart to pinpoint my, my entry and exit. Yes, sir? This is, th these two here, yeah, it's really just the distance apart of a 20-period moving average. There's usually three lines with this, and one is a 20-day 20, 20 moving average in the middle, okay? He uses additional math to filter in the volatility to where instead of just being the one line, if volatility picks up, the bands will start to separate and show the volatility, okay? So it's basically a 20-day moving average with a volatility filter. And it's just easier to see with the, two, with the bands instead of the one line in the middle. Yes, sir? The question is that, depending on trends to last forever, don't I, do I get concerned or worried when the markets move down for a year and a half and I'm looking for another sell? Every time. It's called blind faith. But it's worked for me for years, so I will continue to do that and continue to be concerned and nervous about a trade until I stop trading. But, but I've never not put on a trade because of that. Okay, every time I get in, I say, this has got to be the end. This has got to be the, another Euro Aussie sell, this has got to be the end. You know, I'm, I'm outlasting my welcome here. I've been doing it for a year. But it hasn't stopped yet. And when I look back at old markets and FX, they can trend for two and three years. If you take a step further back, they can trend for five to ten years. Okay, that's the beautiful thing. It's very hard for a country to change this economic situation. It's a lot easier for a company to change its, its situation, okay? The CEO could quit, you know? They could get a new product. I mean, instantly things change. That doesn't happen with countries. It's a long, slow process, you know? And you can usually see it coming in the interest rate environment. So yeah, every time. But I do it anyway. <laughs> and if it proves me right, I'll continue to do it. Yes, sir? Oh, no, closer to 2, 250. <laughs> no, not really. I think a lot of people put on too many lots. That's where they get into trouble. If I've got a $10,000 account, 5% I can risk, that's $500. If my, my trade is 250 bucks, I can open up two lots. People get into problem when they open up 10 lots. Okay? Yeah, the actual risk, there's, there's two equations. You know, there, there, there's two parts of that risk. And where most people, or where more people get into trouble is when they open up too many lots for their account balance, okay? There's nothing wrong with being a one-lot trader. If you've only got like $1,000 and want to use proper money management, there's nothing wrong with starting in a micro account. That's why we have it, okay? But yeah, you know, people always freak out when I say, yeah, I've got a 250 pip stop. And they look at me like, man, I could, I could have been across the hall learning about economic indicators, you know? Uh, but typically, if I'm trading on a daily chart, yeah, they'll be, they'll be closer to maybe between 100. And some of the uh, British pound pairs can be over 250. If it gets over 300, I get a little, little concerned about you know, getting 600 pips in risk. But on the daily chart, I'm looking for 1,000 pip moves. So risking 250 pips is really not too much to, uh, to risk if I'm looking for, if I'm getting a 1 to 4 risk reward ratio. Average true range. This guy looks familiar. 
from Chicago. Average true range kind of gives you an idea of how much the market moves in a day. Okay? It does not tell you when to get into a trade, when to get out of a trade. It doesn't tell you anything. But a lot of people like to use average true range to get an idea of how much they're going to risk on a trade. If they don't like using support and resistance, they use average true range. They know if the market moves 122 pips in a day, they may use about 150 pips stop. And they're sure to be in a trade for at least a day. You know? But it's just basically an idea to give you some idea of the volatility of the market. A 100, 100 pip stop in the euro pound is very, very different from a 100 pip stop in the pound yen. Okay? If you looked at average true range on the euro pound, it might be about 55 to 70. It'll change. If you look in the pound yen, it might be 250 to 300. You know, I've seen it as high as that. So you want to use, adjust your stops according to the volatility of the market, and that's what average true range is. If you read a lot of books about guys who have coded, they may use ATR. One ATR, one and a half ATR, two ATR. You know, and that's why they're doing it, because you're treating each currency pair because it's unique and individual. And in fact, it is. And this is basically all you're going to get is where it is. What is this about? It's by about 80, 85. So the Aussie Swiss is moving about 85 pips a day on average. Okay, so a 100 pip stop is really not too much to ask if I'm just using, you know, if I'm not using support and resistance, but rather just to stop. If I just want to use pure math, ATR is about as good as it gets for that. Yeah, as soon as you shift that chart to a weekly chart, it'll reflect what the average weekly range is automatically. And if you use a five minute, it'll give you the five minute range too. And on this one, we have, it's about 120 pips. The Euro Aussie is about 120 pips. So I might be in tune to use about 125, 150 pip loss. Stop loss. So don't forget that's calculated on 14 periods. You can change that to 20 or 50 or on the ATR? Yeah. Yeah, you can change that to whatever you want. Basically, the 14 period is measuring the last 14 days, the high to low. Yes, sir? If you look at the range, the low to the high from the previous 14 days, and you add those up and divide by 14, it'll be 80. So. Oh, it's right here. Well, this doesn't have it. It's, this is 100, and that's 200, so I'm assuming it's about 120. It better be, because I'm not in the mood to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what computers are, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what this number is. That's taking into account the last 14 days of trading. Yeah, yeah, I could actually widen this and make it higher and it'd probably give me the number, you know. Um, actually, I take most of the numbers off on the side just to kind of clean up the charts for the workshop, but usually it'll give that number on the side. It'll be in with a yellow background or something. I have a question about that. Sometimes when I'm trading, that number is just obliterated by the current price. Yeah, yeah, that's why I get rid of the current price on mine. The Commodity Channel Index by Donald Lambert, another futures trader. It's amazing how all these futures guys are trading all the technical indicators. Maybe they're the only ones that had computers. This is more cyclical in nature, but it really does the same thing. We want to first identify the trend and look for moves against the trend because he's trying to throw in cyclical analysis along with um, being overbought and oversold. Anybody here? Um, Read Raggy Horner's books on trading? I won't tell you who she is because she's with another firm now. Um, but it's actually a pretty good book. And she's big on using the CCI to help identify her entries. As you can see here, I would need something else. Or a lot of people, as it comes down through the minus 100, overbought is minus 100. Excuse me, overbought is plus 100. Oversold is minus 100. So a lot of traders will wait for the peak, and as it moves back up through minus 100, that's their buy. Okay. On the flip side, as it moves up above plus 100, as it reverses and moves back down below, that's their sell. Okay. It's a little bit easier when you already have a directional bias and you're trading the right market. Remember, you know, picking that right market to begin with really is, is more than half the battle. 
Okay? It really is. The average directional index. Okay, this one measures the strength of a trend. You know, I don't use it, but as a matter of fact, we've developed some strategies using it because when the market is moving up, it will show you how strong the trend is. And what we were looking for is when that rolls over and starts to come down, then you might get into a more range bound situation. And on short term trading, we're trying to develop some strategies on that. But basically, we have the same thing is it really doesn't tell you when to get in the market. It just kind of gives you a reference point to where the market is trend trending strongly or not. You know, you can certainly get that information just by looking at the chart, you know, but sometimes if you're going through, remember, these were like developed by guys who were look, analyzing dozens of markets, you know. It just kind of, when this is moving up, the trend is strong. When it's moving down, as you can see right here, this is, this is what it looks like in the market and the prices, and that coincides with the move down. Okay, so if, you, if you're a range-bound trader, if you love those ranges, you would wait for the, um, this to peak, the ADX to peak, and as it's moving down, you can see where the market moves range bound. So that kind of gives you an idea, trending market, range bound market. And we've got the same thing on the Euro Aussie. If you don't mind, I'll flip through these. I'm kind of getting, I don't know how many I've gone through. I didn't number them. Oh, <laughs> maybe that was it. So, which is about perfect. So remember, what I do is I open a daily chart with one year of trading on it. I add a 200 days simple moving average. I look for the strongest trending markets, and I use my favorite indicator to help me time my entry in the direction of the trend. Okay, a simple four-step process for trading. Yes, sir. Was it? Oh, you know why? Simple moving average was one, and I fast stochastics and slow stochastics. That was the. Ah, uh, see, man, I had the answer, too. <laughs> I just get, no. Somebody asked me that before, and I, well, let me count them. I go, oh, yeah, fast stochastics, slow stochastics. Thank you, though. Paying attention. Thank you very much. I'll be here for questions. <laughs>